Hey everybody, thanks for checking out this short little lesson on the Kemp model. Uh, one of the different uh, design methods and models we're going to look at here, it sounds like, uh, in Module 2 and Module 3. Uh, thanks for checking this out. Um, I do this method of teaching a lot with my students, so I'm happy to try it out with you guys as well. Uh, so first off, talk about the history of our Kemp model here. So this is Gerald Kemp, good looking dude. Uh, he was a professor at San Jose State uh, in the education department, and he drew a lot of other disciplines to make a better model of instructional design. And I think one of the things he noted and um, in some interviews he did was that a lot of the, the models were very much instructor-centered, okay? And so the idea, he wanted to make this more of a learning-based instructional design model. So I have a little quote here about planning for student learning should be challenging, exciting, and a graphic activity of trying to make it so that, you know, it's for the learners versus just kind of for the, the planners themselves. And this was in 1985 when he first developed this. Later on then in 2010, it's going to be re revised along with uh, two other members uh, to make what's now called the Morrison, Ross, and Kemp model, also seen as MRK in a lot of our books and materials. Here's our overview. So the biggest thing here is that there's no one perfect approach to solving a kind of design problem with, with the Kemp model, okay? It is a non-linear oval-shaped uh, model that can start at any point. So there's no first starting point you're working with. You can start at any point. Uh, there are nine steps. Maybe steps is the wrong word. Nine elements would be a better part of it maybe that you work through. But once again, you work through them at any order you want to do. You can start anywhere, finish anywhere as you go through it. One thing is the idea of constant revision through your evaluation uh, and making sure that as you evaluate what you're doing, you're reassessing the model, reassessing what's happening, to replan, fear for supports, and what you need. So the big four elements we're going to see our nine elements kind of form into, hope it makes sense how I said that, uh, is about the learners themselves, who's doing the learning, the objectives, what we're going to learn, how to best learn, and uh, have how to best teach it so everyone can learn, and lastly, our evaluation so we can assess if things are being learned or not. I you notice it utilizes both a behavioral and cognitive approach to this, uh, behavior in terms of kind of how we do things, cognitive in terms of what we're learning. And so it kind of teaches both possibly good for both skill learning uh, and also content learning as well uh, as, um, as we try to attempt to teach people what we want them to know and be able to do. Uh, so one model that is compared is very well with is the Dick and Carey model, one that we looked at all in our materials for class as well as uh, one of our other presentations here. The models themselves are very, very, the the parts of the model are very similar, I should say. And you notice some very similar versus what we see over here in the ovals uh, versus what we see in the box of the, of the Dick and Carey method. The two, the major difference is that the Dick and Carey model wants it all to go in a certain order, whereas this is kind of a free-for-all. You start wherever you want to start and end up wherever you wherever at the end. And so the biggest thing here is that the order of how you do things is different versus a more rigid uh, start here, finish here model. This is more free-flowing and flexible, and you kind of start anywhere you want to start in the in the Kemp model. Um, so the target audience is a lot of times classroom use is a big part of this. And you can kind of see this is classroom in general here for both uh, K-12, higher education, adult learning. Um, I think kind of going off of what uh, Kemp was talking about, I can definitely see this being more of a classroom uh, application, but it has been said to be good in other applications as well, the military, other training areas as well. Um, because it really focused on the individual learner themselves and really, really that learner focus part of it and really flexible into different applications. So let's go to the nine elements. We kind of follow as we bop along the, the little oval there. The first one is our goals and instructional problems. So essentially, what problem you're trying to fix or what are the goals of the program you're trying to do? And so some things that I maybe have seen uh, in my experience so far, are like the, the question of what problem we have in terms of a gap between learners and certain different racial groups, that kind of thing. Or if a student is not learning a certain skill, you notice that students cannot do a certain skill. Or if we have certain errors that are happening to reduce those errors. Whatever, whatever, what's our problem is a big question. Then we have who are you teaching? So what is the background of your learners? Um, is their background impacting your student success at all? And how does their background uh, impact that planning? So think about our student background, prior knowledge, age, socioeconomic status, all different kind of things which possibly brought into learner characteristics. Um, maybe not so much idea of learning styles, but also it does do play a role a little bit in terms of age and 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 how you work with, with your learners. So if you do have learners that might be older, maybe the uh, fully online model might be more difficult for them without more technology supports and those ideas. So you can kind of see how this may play then into what your support services are needed as you go through evaluation. Uh, you have the third element, which is your course content and task analysis, essentially what needs to be learned. 
right? Um, is this a content issue or a skill issue is a big question. Are we teaching about content you have to know or a certain skill thing we cannot perform yet? And what kind of additional knowledge do you need to perform that certain skill, especially if you don't have that background knowledge that's necessary? So what needs to be learned is our big thing there. Then we have our uh, uh, instructional objectives. So what must the learner do to be proficient, right? So we're looking at proficiency, what was going to happen? By the end of this lesson, end of this training, end of this module, what can the student be able to do? What should they know and, the, and that whole idea? Um, in the classroom, you may see it as like the I can, we will statements, right? By the end of this lesson, I will be able to do this because we just did this in class. That's one of those ideas of, of, of instructional objectives that may come in there. Uh, we have our content sequencing. So what is the most effective order for learning in this part? So looking at all the material we have, is there background or context we need to sit to work with first? Is there some theory learning before hands on application? Uh, do you teach things thematically or chronologically? Essentially sitting down with your team and figuring out what order things need to be taught in so it's the easiest for the learner to possess. Uh, we have the instructional message of it. So what words and images will be used to teach material? How do you translate the plan we have into our lesson? Uh, the words, the elements, the graphics. Essentially, how do you make this whole thing understandable is a big part of this. How do you make it so the overall goal you have can go the, into the students, into the, into the, into the lesson uh, that we're trying to teach? We do have our instructional strategy from there, too. So essentially, um, what are you trying to get people to do? Is it recall the information? Is it integrate information? So basically, take the idea and how to apply it. Is it organization, make it to a new form, elaborating, adding the new info in there, making diagrams, really other topics? What are the things that these kids are going to do while we're learning, or pre I should say? I probably just say kids, just the whole K-12 part of my background. Um, well, what are these going to be people going to be doing as they're learning? And what is the goal we have for the strategy we want them to make, make happen? So do we want them to just recall information, know our, our, our protocol or our set of instructions? Do we want them to be able to transform it and to be able to explain it back in their own, in their own language? Are we trying to make this new form? So taking data, making it to a new idea, wherever it might be. We have our assessments then. So obviously, how are we going to determine our effectiveness? Is it going to be a case of can they show us a certain skill? Can they write something? Can they explain something? How do we know that our learners learned what they were supposed to learn and now can achieve those objectives? And lastly, our resource. What do we need for this? Do we need lecture? Do we need text? Do we need videos? Do we need diagrams? Do we need web pages? What do we actually need to make this whole thing happen is a big thing. And how do you want to, what kind of materials do we have to make to make sure that things are delivered in the best way possible? So going through here, what are some of the benefits to the thing? I think biggest benefit is, is very, very learner focused. Um, a big benefit is that you're looking at learners you have. Um, and it's also very, very flexible and allows things to be very creative in how you're doing things. It's that flexibility piece might be really great for some, especially more experienced um, designers so they can figure out kind of where they want to be. Uh, also, you can put on certain pieces of starting data, not just, you know, where you start other models that what you have to start with, but you can start anywhere in terms of your data. It could be, we want to teach a certain way. We want to bring a certain idea in. Wherever it might be, you can start there. Uh, also, you have a circular model. So the cool idea of revision is a big part of it. In the K-12 world, uh, we call it being a reflective pa practitioner. Um, so you're kind of revising each as you use it. Each time you teach this, revising and bring things back around. And it's really great for big groups because you can start process at the same time. So if you're working with a whole team or a whole district, I can see this being a really cool way of making that happen. Some challenges. Um, number one, novice According to some of the research, novice designers may have some issues with lack of structure, especially when you kind of structure to get started because it's fluid versus rigid. It's kind of hard to see relationships sometimes. It can be kind of muddy as you go through some areas. Also, you have, if you have a very small group working here, everyone may want to do the same steps all at the same time and just make it a little muddy as you want to do as you go through these steps. And so the challenge of this, of this model could be in how um, the group works together and make that happen. Um, and... That's a big thing. So looking at our summary here, we have Gerald Camp, who made our model. The idea, big idea is that it's circular versus linear. There's no one starting point to this idea, focusing on who is learning, what is to be learned, how best to learn, and how to assess that that learning happened. Okay, we see those big focuses in nine elements that can be done in any order, any time, with constant revision to improve that process. So I thank you all for checking this out. And if you have more questions or if I miss something, please feel free to let me know. I greatly appreciate it. Take it easy, y'all. Have a wonderful day.